presenting their most recent exploration into new ways of feeling and ways of feeling new. We're lucky to have all three members of the Institute of New Feeling with us tonight. Scott Andrew, Agnes Bolt, and Nina Sarnelli. Their collaborative has been profiled in the Huffington Post, Hyperallergic, and Art in America. They've exhibited their works in various settings, nationally and internationally. Institute for New Feeling is contributing to our senses series in a number of ways. Our guests recently developed a line of fragrances called A Collection of Air Qualities, which includes scents such as Hit Song, with ingredients of wintergreen, waffle batter lip gloss, band-aid, nail glue, cheap tang top, air conditioning, and chlorine. Following the lecture, if you haven't already, um, all of you will have an opportunity uh, to take home a little sample of the perfume scents as well. And the perfume line actually is a really good example of what you'll find in much of the Institute's work, a collusion between the absurd and the earnest. Through their co um, combination of tongue-in-cheek humor and utter seriousness, their work is able to crystallize a critical view of wellness in our culture at the shifting, slippery intersection of capitalism, technological innovation, and the body. Tonight's lecture will also expand our investigations beyond the physical limitations of the traditional five senses by considering the influence of scientific advancement and technological ubiquity. Taking the form of a number of diverse media works, including videos, virtual reality, SEO marketing, and digital publications, Institute's projects frequently explore the role technology plays in the desire for self-improvement. Some people might greet Institute for New Feelings work with the same empirical skepticism reserved for shamans or um, healing crystals um, or contemporary art for that matter. Um, but I think um, like these examples with some openness and perhaps a little placebo effect, um, you might experience something that unexpectedly engages your senses, something transformative, something new. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Scott Andrew, Agnes Bolt, Nina Sarnelli, the Institute for New Feeling. Thanks, Gretchen, for that lovely introduction. Um, as uh, was mentioned, we're a three-person art collective. Um, we're based in Los Angeles and in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and essentially we've constructed this identity around ourselves. Um, this institution that is committed to the development of ways, new ways of feeling and ways of feeling new. Um, so I'm Nina, this is Scott and Agnes, um, and we kind of, our work spans a lot of different media. Um, we do a lot of interactive work. Um, we're gonna kind of touch on a few uh, projects in each category, I'd say. Um, so our, inter our, our interactive work often frames itself as a kind of treatment or therapy, sometimes a retreat session. Um, we also have a body of sculptural work, which is um, usually framed as a, as a product. We have a line of speculative, speculative wellness products, which the perfume is part of. So we'll talk about that really briefly. Um, and we're actually gonna do a presentation of all of the advertisements from our wellness product line at Counterpath tomorrow night. So if you're interested in the product line, there's more about that tomorrow. Um, and then we also have a lot of visual work, a lot of video and, um, and image-based work. Um, that we sort of position in this place of marketing and advertising um, and, uh, and different processes related to that, so, and web work also like that. So we're gonna focus on three of our most recent projects um, and show them in full, and then we'll touch on a couple other things briefly that you can see online or check out for yourself. Um, so the first project is actually gonna be a lengthy video. This is a video we completed earlier this year. It's called This Is Presence. Um, it was commissioned by Ballroom Marfa in Marfa, Texas for the Artist Film International Program, which is a program uh, started by Whitechapel Gallery in London. And, and essentially the way it works is the films that are, that are commissioned for that, prod, for that program tour to a lot of different spaces around the world. So it's been screening at some really amazing institutions, the Istanbul Modern, the, um, uh, the MAT, art, 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 art and Architecture in Lisbon, uh, Whitechapel, of course, a uh, space in Buenos Aires. So, so we're really excited about this video, and this is um, so we're going to show it um, start to finish. It's 17 minutes long, 
Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it afterward too. Essentially, we think about This Is Presence as a kind of brand identity campaign. Um, so essentially, we, we're thinking about um, the ways that identity is constructed, uh, maintained, and manipulated online. Um, and specifically, the difference between the way that you or I might do it um, through social media or through our personal websites um, and the way that a corporation does it. Um, so there's, there are whole industries, as you probably know, um, around um, the creation, the invention of, of an identity for an, for an institution um, and, and maintaining a presence. So the, the title, this is, this is Presence, comes from that. Um, so essentially what we were thinking about when we were constructing this is like, what would it be like um, to navigate this landscape, um, this, this sort of identity of the Institute for New Feeling, the people and places and processes um, and materials that make up our institution. Now, of course, we don't actually own any of those facilities, um, and those are not actually our laborers. Um, and even to talk a little bit about the process in this video, there's no stock footage in the video. There's nothing that wasn't shot by us. Um, so it was really important for us to create, um, or Ben, um, <laughs> for us to create um, this sort of reality factor, you know, um, to create the specificity of going to real institutions um, and not to have this feeling the sort of distancing effect of seeing material that you know is fake, if that makes sense. Um, so, so this is something that we're sort of interested in aesthetically is the way that corporations sort of emulate um, and reflect the real, especially more savvy um, institutions today. 
Um, they don't announce themselves necessarily as corporations, but they kind of insinuate themselves into our everyday lives. Um, yeah, so that's This Is Presence. The next project is called Seek, and it's sort of a, maybe a different angle on the internet. So we were really interested in this idea of the information that we put out into the internet, um, personal data, um, security sort of questions, the sort of um, darker maybe side of um, putting ourselves out into the internet and seeing how that information might um, come back at us in some, some other way. So Seek is um, uh, a piece that we did a, that was um, created and commissioned last year by a space in New York called Recess. And it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction um, between a participant and one of us that's sort of sitting behind the scenes. Um, as you can see in the image, um, we created this customized chair that's augmented with um, a monitor and um, a scanner, and then they have headphones on. And this individual is then talking to um, one of us behind the scenes. And uh, we've sort of misused the internet. Some of this information that I just mentioned that would be sort of um, asked of the participant gets called together to create customized videos that we sort of see as divinations or sort of future readings um, made for that person. So we're gonna show you a little video of um, each of these platforms and how it goes. And you'll see in that video um, short clips of the ultimate result of, um, of the experience. Fear of being scammed. It is not cheap, but it depends on the use in months. I cannot take it anymore. Let's see for yourself, because God has a sense of humor. It does not make up for the winter. Could you please spell your last name for me? M-I-L-L-E-R. Okay. And your first name? Genevieve. Could you spell that? G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E. -E -E -E. It looks like you had a really definitive peak back here in September of 2004. Um, 478 Clifton Street. Does this look familiar at all? Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's the one on, on the left. Right here? In the back. Could you please share with me your mother's maiden name? Morris. Do you have any pre-existing conditions? Mm, asthma. Could you name a place that you regularly avoid? I guess my ex-boyfriend's house. Slumber. Pills. Tumultuous. Fragmented. Soccer. Soccer? Soccer. Um, black and white. Oh, here it is. Yes, and a tour de force. One. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven. How are you feeling right now? Mm, it's a little hot. And that reading again was what? Seven. Thank you. Little Hot Rod by RL Studio for mm. South Sea Imports Cotton Fabric Number Eight Thirty Seven. Little by Little Designs Company, hot. Look at that tassel. This tassel here? Yeah. Hot pink graduation tassel. Uh, I have one more scan I'd like to do. And let's see what we can find that's similar. Crater, moon. Lava. Yeah, that's nice. Just relax and I'm gonna 
begin to process your video here. Let me go ahead and just open this full. Yes, and a tour de force. Yes, and a tour de force. So I'm not sure how clear it is to everybody, but each of the little sections in the um, experience then added up to create that video in the end. So the audio was recorded um, after this sort of um, infinite Google translation, and that became the audio for the video. The butt scan was made into this sort of wallpaper that um, covered the rock that sort of was this avatar floating through this space. Um, there was various color elements based on um, algorithm of their name and so on. So it all of it came together to create these individualized videos. Um, and uh, let's show them the butt scans too. Just fun little extra. <laughs> so this was just like, we had I think over like 150 maybe people that came through this space. It was always booked, but this is a little section of their New York butts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, another new project that was shown at the same time as This Is Presence. It was commissioned by Ballroom Marfa, and it is a virtual reality experience. It's called Ditherer. And we think of this project as a proposal for the future of shopping. It's a dramatized virtual shopping experience and it's made for the technology that's called HTC Vive. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, and um, we also received some support from the Studio for Creative Inquiry at CMU, uh, where I teach at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, we collaborated with a lot of different people in this project. Um, so we worked with a 3D graphics artist, Gary Tyler, and some additional programmers uh, and artists, and we're still working on it. It's going to be going on for a, a a probably a, a year time. or more. Um, <laughs> so what we're showing right now is an initial prototype, and um, eventually we're going to have seven different products that are highlighted through this experience. But right now we started off with the avocado. And I'll show you a walkthrough so you can kind of get a feel for what this experience is like. But whenever you enter into the experience, you are brought into a kind of a, a big box sort of warehouse space where you can choose a product and then it takes you into a fantasy world that's based on that product. Um, and the fantasy worlds that we create, it's kind of akin to something like a Herbal Essences commercial, you know, where you start to use the shampoo and then you drift it away to the rainforest. But the difference here is we kind of complicate that a little bit more. So you might hear things like celebrity endorsements or different types of controversies, um, different types of maybe propaganda around the product. Pyramid schemes. Yeah. <laughs> Just, Ingredients, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, strange trivia, you name it. Um, and the other thing with this is we wanted it to be an actual proposal for what we think shopping probably will become. And so we, we, we worked with a programmer and we were able to have it set up so you can actually order these items um, through the virtual experience and have them shipped to you via Amazon Prime. Um, so the products that we're working with, um, you can have a six pack of avocados, um, Fuku Tech seven inch car visor video screen, Sinful Shine Nail Polish on Fire from the Ky uh, King Kylie Collection. Uh, the Universe, the Mega Collection Blu-ray Disc. Jet Lag Rapid Reset Pills. Balance Bar Gold S'more Flavor. And Simpatico Hobnail Candle, which is an ambergris flavor or scent. This is a quick look at what the fantasy world that we've created, just a, a, a screenshot from that. And I think, the avocado world. Yeah, the avocado world. Um, I think I'm going to just jump through and go ahead and show you the walkthrough video so you can get a feel for it. Sinful Colors, King Kylie Collection, Sinful Shine, On Fire. This product comes from the exclusive nail polish line by Kylie Jenner, socialite daughter of Caitlyn Jenner. On Fire is a non-vegan shellac nail polish cured with UV light and produced from the resin created by female lac bugs. Female lac bugs excrete their resin onto the tropical Butea monsperma trees and in jet lag rapid reset. One of the active ingredients in these time zone travel relief pills is the tropical legume Macuna pruriens, also called the Florida velvet bean donkey eye or buffalo bean. The plant is notorious for causing severe itchiness. Severe itch the Universe Mega Collection on Blu-ray. Blu-ray discs are red by a blue laser. 
blue lasers emit electromagnetic radiation, giving them applications for magnetic levitation. Magnetic levitation is used in maglev trains like Shanghai's trans -rack. Avocados, fresh, large, good taste. In English, the original name for the avocado was alligator pear. The California Avocado Growers Exchange pushed to change this to the more exotic and appealing avocado, an Aztec word that means testicle, probably because avocados grow in pears. This change began a massive marketing effort to promote what was then a minor cash crop. Among the many campaigns was Mr. Ripe Guy, a man in a full-body avocado costume who drove an avocado-colored Mazda. The lonely Mr. Ripe then launched a nationwide contest to find Ms. Ripe, a woman who would exemplify the California lifestyle. This class needs good nutrition, including vitamins A, B1, C, E, potassium, niacin, iron, and this body gets them all in California avocados for just 153 calories in a luscious shell. The avocados ripen better together. Shrimp taco salad. Pepper sauce, cumin, coriander, and salt. Four. Cut kernels off ears of corn. Arrange zucchini and avocado on platter. Top with corn, shrimp, and watermelon. To serve, sprinkle with corn chip crumbs and drizzle. So I wanted a one-story house also with no thresholds. I wanted George and I to be able to grow old here and get our wheelchairs or walkers if we have them uh, through all of the doors. I'm pretty ruthless about getting rid of things. So this is our big living room that we designed, and this is really where we sit, uh, you know, all day, really. I mean, any time of day that we're talking or watching sports on television. Fukutech Universal Car Sun Visor, Video Mirror, Screen Monitor, HD Backup, Rear View Camera. Fukutech is a company based out of Shenzhen, China, that distributes. In the scene, you know, once you pick up the the product and you're taken into the scene, all of the different things that you're seeing are also, you know, building upon that um, conspiracy data. So there are little things hidden here and there, some of which you might not even notice, like uh, Pearl Jam's avocado album um, being on the table. Or um, I mean, we start off in this space that is um, it's Tom. Selleck. Yeah, Tom Selleck's truck that you're riding on the back of his truck because he he was involved in this scandal where um, he was siphoning water um, for his avocado ranch in Northern California. Yeah, so well, like you're driving through his avocado ranch essentially. You, you guys only heard like a section of the actual rabbit hole um, narrative for the yeah. avocado, so it's very long and it's, lots of different complicated stories in there. Yeah. I mean, you're hearing Jason Mraz because he also owns an avocado farm. <laughs> um, George W. Bush's guacamole recipe. Yeah. yeah, you end in the Bush Ranch house, basically, um, watching the, the football game that uh, was on when he famously choked on a pretzel. So you kind of like, you start in one place and it links you from one detail to the next, to the next, to this, till you're like choking on a pretzel and you have no idea what that has to do with avocados or how you got there, essentially, you know? Um, the idea being that you're kind of like, we're, it's, dramatizing that moment of trying to decide whether or not to buy something and and it becomes more and more complex as you kind of like dither <laughs> literally in the details you know mm -hmm. yeah. so um, we have a line of um, conceptual products that we kind of like to frame and think about as being something that can be situated maybe in a gallery and in a art context, but also potentially in the CVS or in like a commercial context and just sort of playing with that slippery notion of can this be a functioning object? Is, what's its value culturally? What's its value potentially commercially? And maybe suggesting use, but also failing miserably at it. Um, so what you're looking at here is, um, is an installation uh, that is up right now actually at Bulver Marfa again. Uh, we have a big solo show there right now and this is a sort of pedestal that's built with um, all of our products sort of attached to it. So in this image um, there's a vortex that you can see that has a sort of spinning goo inside of it that contains 
um, a, an aging cream. So it's a cream that was sort of um, developed in our laboratory in Southern California that essentially proposes to age the body. This kind of idea of um, you know accelerating towards death, like <laughs> consuming to the point of um, the end. Um, there's also in this image um, the Klein bottle, which is um, is a proposition for the shape of the universe, which contains that and bottles that product, um, and a dripping. Um, dispenser that sort of um, drips the goo into the vortex. Um, let's see what else. This is um, a close-up of our foot insert, which is a um, customized moleskin insert that sort of is branded with um, our logo, our Institute for New Feeling logo, um, but it also proposes to sort of um, touch on various um, pressure point systems on the foot and um, heal various physical, emotional, psychological conditions. Um, but we also think of it as this kind of this branding that's sort of always present without being seen. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that while you're wearing it, you you remember it and you feel it always. Something stuck in your shoe. Yeah, it's you know? sort of like an insidious, <coughs> hidden marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. um, this is our new uh, product, which is um, a series of scents. We like to call them um, air qualities, and they were it was just commissioned for a project in Brussels this summer. Um, we have six cents, and essentially we worked with this um, community garden uh, in Brussels that um, had herbs, and we, each of these scents contains one of the herbs, but we also um, surveyed the community and asked them this question of what is in the air, and we got these really interesting responses that were both like psychological, political, dark, um, you know, there was a bombing recently in the Brussels airport, so some people sort of responded to that sort of attack and of uh, terror. Um, so each of these scents um, has a series of ingredients that plays with some of the responses based on that community along with the herbs. So for example, Gretchen had mentioned um, Hit Song, which is supposed to be kind of a lighter, the lighter spectrum of, um, of the scents, which is kind of like a hot, summer, sweaty teenage song. But we also have something that's maybe slightly darker, um, like Eviction, which has chamomile, a uh, wine left out at night, unpaid gas bill, hole dug in the lawn, wet cardboard, spackle, spicy celery, and harissa soup. So um, these scents are outside, you guys might have noticed, and you'll be able to um, sample them later. We definitely don't recommend that you put them on your body because they're not beautiful, they're interesting and weird, and also have, um, they develop over time. There's a sort of undertone and overtone, so the initial smell might be like very specific, but over time it sort of changes and evolves. So we recommend that you maybe spray those outside or um, on little customized cards that we have that also have all the ingredients listed on them. Um, let's, should we do the other? I just um, wanted to mention too with this that we worked with the Institute for Art yes, and All Faction you. in LA that is a, a group that, or it's one person, but who um, <laughs> is one a, person a, a perfumer um, <laughs> and skilled in making sense. And so it was a collaborative process with her to create those. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, this is a, a series of contact lenses, which um, right now exist as a prototype, and they sort of exist in two different forms, one as a lens and one as a sculpture, and they um, temporarily blind the user. So if you look at the lens itself, it has a sort of blacked out section on the pupil that if you put on your eye will blind you. Um, but as you can see in this sort of piece right here, this is a sculpture that has a thumb drive that contains the commercial for the lens itself. Um, so and, and you can also see on the eye, there's a sort of palindrome that says, um, see me through or see, me, see through me, um, which, you know, as a secondary person, you can see close up. You have to get eye. very close to be able to read it in yeah. somebody's eye. And this is an installation shot of the um, video itself, which is presented on a flat screen horizontally and has um, water over the surface, so you can kind of play with the image as a sort of moving, um, changing. It's sort of like analog vision. filter or mm -hmm. something that you're moving with your hands. And the, like all of these products that I'm presenting right now, as Nina mentioned, are going to be shown Friday evening at Counterpath. That's tomorrow. Yep. Yeah, tomorrow yeah. night. At 7. So this is the aging cream that I mentioned, and we had uh, installed it originally as a sort of performance with two bodies laying on the ground. Um, with this sort of uh, product dripping onto them, this idea suggesting that their, their bodies are sort of like harnessing and 
creating um, the cream itself. And it's, there's almost um, an, a borealis of an, an old body and a young body kind of coming together. Ouroboros. 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 An aurora borealis. <laughs> <laughs> the northern lights of bodies <laughs> coming together. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of Agnes with you guys. That was a cute one. <laughs> that was a cute one, like that. Belki Bartokamas style. Um, <laughs> If anybody remembers that. This is a concrete neck pillow, like an airplane pillow, but with a lot of weight and um, sort of burden to wear rather than comfort. Mm -hmm. The last thing I just want to talk about quickly is Feltbook, which is a project that is a curatorial um, platform, which exists as a digital book online. Um, we worked with about 150 international artists um, with this idea, this prompt of um, creating a treatment or a therapy, um, almost like a contemporary update to a fluxus score, if you guys know what flux is, the fluxus movement. Um, this idea of um, presenting some sort of small conceptual solution to maybe a contemporary condition. Um, so the book exists online in various forms, from text to video to digital works to um, what else? Sculpture work. There's works. sculpture works Basically and documentation. Basically everything you can imagine. <laughs> And we've shown it in a lot of different contexts of screen it. So it's something that we're, we have as a kind of collection and then we're able to sort of like curate these little screenings or shows, exhibitions. We had, um, we had actually a one night exhibition in Denver um, last year, two years ago? Last, last summer. Yeah. And I was just gonna direct you to um, our website. If you wanna experience the full book, it lives on in our website as a searchable, a kind of randomized or database where you are given a prompt, and when you respond to this prompt, you're given a solution that is your um, kind of felt book remedy, um, given whatever type of answer that you supply. So uh, if you go to instituteforanewfeeling.com, you can um, experience the felt book. So. Click on felt book. Yeah. And then you get it. And that's it. That's it. Is that right? Okay. You guys have so much that's interesting that's, that, that's going on that I think you could ask about. Um, so I'll just kind of zero in on uh, one potentially minor thing. But how did you can, you, can you say something about the process of coming up with the, the new feeling, the Institute for New Feeling tattoo, or the, the, the kind of body marking, or the, I guess the it's the logo. logo but Whoa, um, never had that about that or about transferring <laughs> over to an actual body marking and the, and the foot um, uh, mm -hmm. material that you did too? Huh. Well, one thing that we think about a lot in this idea, I mean, the, 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 the logo is essentially just a logo. It's just a, a simple symbol that we sort of replicating, you know, um, similar systems in the world. But I think um, the idea of these two sort of conflicting forms, I think, is, is relevant in it um, because our work is sort of, we're often asked a question, more popular question is, um, what is new feeling? <laughs> what, what, how we define new feeling? And very often I think we're thinking about it as a kind of contradiction or a kind of conflation of two existing things to create something new. Um, and, and I think even Gretchen touched, touched on that in our intro, this idea of sort of playfulness and sort of um, sincerity kind of coexisting in this tense relationship with each other. Um, so I think that the logo with the circle and the and the squiggle kind of provides this tension, you know, between two forms. Yeah, I think of it as a way to like kind of build off or build, uh, play off of um, having the sort of mythology built up around us as an institution. Right. And I think there's definitely a reference that can be made there to cults. Many cults have some type of symbol that they're known by or, or religions for that matter. Um, and not that we're necessarily referencing any specific religion or cult, but I think that it kind of is an alignment Iconography with that. is just important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also that we were looking at like medical references, right? Remember, like way back when? <laughs> yeah. And I, I would also say like this well, idea of repetition. So it begins as a logo, but then it sort of continuously appears in videos and, and other as a sort of propaganda that just doesn't want to leave you. It becomes almost like burned in the back of your eyes. You know, it's, um, it's just present. It's always present the way like there's a corporate commercial sort of um, presence that's always asking you to, to buy something. Um, so like, <laughs> and not in failing most of the time. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we're very much like playing with being a corporation um, and, and there's a dark side to it, that sort of like continuous barrage of this, of this logo. There is one project we didn't show here, it's called Watermark, it, that has, that is essentially exactly what you just said. It's like a kind of strobing, um, 
use of that logo in a video form that you sort of sit, you actually sit in a personal steam sauna um, <laughs> while you watch it. But the idea being that it's sort of when you leave the experience, that mark is burned on your retina in some way. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Uh, a lot of the work seems to reference sort of a temporal visual language, things that are really contemporary, uh, which as we know in the internet world is it's gonna age really quickly. So I'm wondering if you've thought about how the work ages visually and how those references change as the work ages. It's a good question. I mean, first I would say like, <laughs> we have to work within our time and not to think of ourselves, like canonizing ourselves beyond what we're responding to at the moment, which is very real for us. Like this is our world, so it's hard to, for like for us to avoid it because it's just a continuous stimulation. Um, but I think one thing we have been thinking a lot about this year is um, this idea of like creating this sort of corporate glossy image and thinking about the humans behind it and the vulnerability of ourselves as individuals and how we're like a bunch of broke artists that pretend to be bigger than we are. And that is something we wanna bring into the work itself and sort of like uh, undermine our own identity as a corporation. So we're thinking right now about how to possibly basically bring in a little bit of vulnerability of like of the individual sort of against this larger institution that's sort of eating us up as, as individuals. I would say too, it's not necessarily at all the same, but I get a lot of, um, lately I've been watching a lot of Black Mirror, I don't know if you guys have seen this show or not, <laughs> but um, just thinking about like the timeliness of how they're talking about technology in this show, again, not that our work is really the same, but um, that it is this sort of mirror back on contemporary issues, you know, and it is made to be viewed in this time given you know, what is happening in the world right now. So I think, yeah, it might not m make the same sense later on, but we're kind of, you know, we're making it for contemporary problems, so. Yeah, I think it's nowhere near as um, problematic as in the VR experience, um, partially because that technology is changing so fast that by the time we finish our stupid project, <laughs> our technology could be obsolete. I mean, literally like in a year or two, you know, like, um, at least, like, if you think about, like, where Oculus was, like, you, you know, like, it's already moved, advanced beyond that so far. And, um, uh, and then also the, the idea that we're inventing this sort of form for online shopping, but so are Amazon and Alibaba and <laughs> people with, who are really going to do it. Like, there will be VR online shopping for sure, like, definitely. It won't look like what we're doing. Um, which is kind of interesting, I think, as a way, of, as a sort of broken proposal in a sense. So even if it, in 10 years, what does it mean? I mean, it's sort of in conversation with this other technology that came out at that moment, but it also means a lot to us as humans, right? You know, I mean, I think all, any yeah, good artwork. Yeah, if we can't artwork, reflect on the things that are affecting our lives right now as we're changing, then like, what do we, what do we think about? Like, should we make timeless paintings? I mean. <laughs> no offense to painting, but hey. it's like, <laughs> it's I just... mean, no, and I think, I think essentially all of these things come back to, to a sort of <coughs> deeper question about, you know, online identity management becomes down to a lot of questions that, that, that are on and offline, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't think that the work necessarily has to be restricted, even though it's e clearly using that language. Can you talk about artificial intelligence? and help us understand what's artificial and what's intelligence? <laughs> well, I don't think nope. any of us are experts in that <laughs> area, um, so I, I, it's hard to artificial speak to. Artificial intelligence, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's definitely huh. not something that we're really approaching. Yeah, we're not with. really working with, with AI much. I mean, it's not something we would not work with, but mm. and there's some like robotics and stuff in the video of it. I feel like that's a question, the way he phrased it, that's like not exactly about AI. It's about what is artificial and what is intelligent. There's a, there's a metaphor there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Somebody have a good answer. I mean, I think, you know, Gretchen touched upon our sort, of, our sort of interest in the placebo and this idea of interjecting the human and this desire of wanting to animate something that's not real and that's sort of um, maybe uncanniness of like what is um, human and what is not human and we certainly like exist in that place of, of you know being uncomfortable and, and embracing that uncomfortableness. 
of something between one and the other. Sure, like tension between artificial and non-artificial, I would say, is like, is all over, you know. I don't know how to place it in regards to intelligence, but certainly, even like what we're talking about with the sort of, the new aesthetic of the Institute, sort of taking in this sort of documentarian approach, you know, um, and disguising the, kind, the brand in a way, um, is something that I think has a lot to do with perceived artificiality, and um, it sort of flips in on itself. Like it's real content, but then, um, it's framing itself as an institution, which is actually just three real, very real broke artists, like Agnes said, which is, you know, so it's sort of like it, it flip, does a bunch of backflips, I guess, between the two. I can, one thing I would say that I remember we talked a lot about whenever we were working on this as presidents was we were thinking about um, how there's a lot of bot activity online that we can't even interface with. It's like a whole other mm. synth synthetic language. Like it's like been referred 70%. to as a wilderness yeah. that we can't engage with. Um, like most of the internet is made up, like if you thought of it as a territory of this wilderness that's not accessible to humans, which is kind of an amazing, I terrifying idea, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. but what to do with that? Cool fact. <laughs> Hey, check out this cool fact. Coming next year. <laughs> Coming soon. Cool facts. I'd be interested to hear what you would have to say about why it is important to feel new. Hey. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of obvious that there's so much sameness in our lives. <laughs> um, so why huh. to hear you speak about? That's interesting. Mm. Why, I, I, why we well, my, my first reaction is to say, like when I was just saying about sort of um, embracing the uncomfortableness of two in-betweens, you know? It's like in our Western world, we tend to sort of shy away from pain and um, of kind of wanting to have easy so solutions to things, but like having, being in a precarious place is a really fertile place to be because it creates new opportunities one direction or another, like failure or something generative, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fertile place to be. So kind of embracing the two sort of um, contradictions, which are going to sh shift very quickly, you know, as as we move forward in the future, um, but just like getting to stop a little bit in that moment, I think is really interesting. I think it also provides like a reaction or a sort of way out from sort of the the postmodern ironic condition. <laughs> in a way, it's like it's like, or the cynicism of that. In a, you know, it allows for us to be to attempt something. Um, utterly sincere, but without forgetting the fact that we are cynical, that we, we live in this world, that we know things, you know, that we, we know things that are, that things are complex and that there's, there's a kind of defeatism to that. So I think in a way it kind of offers a little bit of hope <laughs> that we could, we could be both and, you know. Um. I think for me it's just a cure for boredom to try to have <laughs> ways of having sure. things thrown at me that I can't Stimulation. anticipate. I really appreciate when other people do that for me and uh, you know mostly I'm experiencing that through complicated like installations that are you know triggering some kind of cognitive dissonance in my brain where maybe it is like pleasure and pain at the same time or, or who knows what it is but um, so I'm you know interested th like through our collaboration to try to offer experiences like that for other people. I don't know if we're always successful in that, but um, that's, that's kind of what I hope to provide, so. Um, I'm wondering if you ever get the opportunity to present your products in a space outside of the gallery in more public spaces like Sam's Club or something, and if so, <laughs> like, <laughs> how is that a contract experience Sam's different? <laughs> um, I, I think we'd love that. Like, yeah. I mentioned that it is, you know, we're kind of interested in presenting our work in both contexts, and so far it's been mostly the art context, but, um, but yes, well, like for instance, we, I mean, we could talk about this um, yeah. extension of this is presence, which is a massage treatment that's um, offered in the L.A. River. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, if, if you guys don't know, is basically sludge. It's just a very conte contested, like a, yeah, a symbol of drought and pollution and sort of economic or I mean, ecological failure in the city. Um, but to see it as this kind of like tranquility fountain, it's really beautiful. This is a really beautiful experience. But, um, but in terms of like a commercial um, space, like you're talking about, like a big box store or a franchise, we haven't done that yet, and we've certainly thought about like how to do that, but haven't come up with like a compelling enough way to do it besides just you know trying to market it to a store. 
Yeah, but I think it's definitely an interesting idea. It's the problem becomes sort of like how to retain that sort of like in between place, you know? Um, because if it's just product, that's not very interesting, and if it's just art, I mean, that's what we're doing with the product so far is like just art framework. Um, that's like maybe not as interesting either. It's like something in between. If they could, if it could retain a bit of both, um, I don't know. But but I will say that our history of working together is like very much involved in outside of art spaces. It's actually the product line is I would say like the only thing <laughs> that's been pretty gallery centric. Um, and it was also the first time we were making objects together. So there's sort of like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're kind of, we're thinking about that. Do you have some ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Any contacts? <laughs> and we talk about that a lot. We have a, an, like a retreat session that's like a performance that we, we've mused many times about if we could just market ourselves as motivational speakers, we could just like, quit all of our day jobs and make a ton of money because it works, you know? Um, so like we do, we do very often like think about the extrapolation outside of an art context, but the products haven't quite gotten there yet, I don't think. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much. <laughs>